Hey guys, Big Red 3, I'm back with another video. Uh, I want to talk about Ring of Honor and uh, just the product in general and the momentum structure of the product. If you recall, the last time I did a wrestling video, I had reviews from 2012. It is currently 2014. Well, in this video, I have reviews from 2013 and lots of them and late 2013 at that. Uh, if you're asking how I did it, I just had a lot of free time. I was just cracking down watching Ring of Honor. Um, I would continue watching the Ring of Honor shows from 2013 that I missed, but I promised uh, Trademark 629 that we would do our Wrestling Observer Awards video, which we're going to do. But I told them that before I did the video, I wanted to watch all the top matches from 2013 from New Japan that I hadn't seen yet. And I've seen almost all of them. I'm only missing like one or two. And once I finish that, then um, we'll do the video. Me and Trademark, we'll get it up here for you guys, and we'll do our awards for the rest of that. For the rest of that. Uh, for the rest of that video. Uh, but so far, at least all uh, the New Japan matches have been really, really, really great. If you haven't, if you didn't get to see any New Japan in 2013, I would really check it out. Uh, especially any match involving Katsuyori Shibata. That guy's awesome. His match with Hiroki Goto and his matches with Tomohiro Ishii from last year, both were just insane, insane. And uh, yeah, so I would definitely recommend stuff like that. But let me talk about Ring of Honor very quickly. Um, basically, how I'm going to handle this is that uh, for 2013, I am going to catch up. Um, I have a new process in that I watch wrestling when I go to the gym. And it's actually working out really well for me. I'm getting, I'm, I'm able to crack out a lot of wrestling lately. So I'm still missing. Here's what I plan on watching. All the eight PWG shows from last year. All of them, um, I think there was like nine or ten Dragon Gate USA slash of all shows from last year that I haven't seen yet. I've already seen the January triple shot and I've already seen WrestleMania weekend from last year. So I plan on watching the rest of that. And I plan on watching what I've currently deemed to believe to be 16 Ring of Honor house shows uh, from last year. I've, I saw eight in like the span of a week. So I can see 16 very soon. So if all goes to plan, I should be all cut up on 2013, hopefully by like March or April. And then by June, I'll be caught up on everything in 2014 and I'll be caught up on wrestling for the first time in like three fucking years, which would be amazing. But baby steps, baby steps. But I want to, I'm going to try to keep things relevant when I do reviews. I want to talk about things that are sort of topical. This video isn't about the ROH reviews. It's more about the Ring of Honor product in general, but I will mention the reviews very quickly. First off, I'll say the, this period of Ring of Honor from Best in the World 2013 to Death Before Dishonor 2013 was probably the best period for the company all year. Um, this was right after they canceled the iPay-per-views, and a lot of people start to get really down on the company, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But I thought the product that they put out in that time period when they didn't have a world champion was really good. It was almost like the company felt that because they didn't have a world champion, they had to make sure the shows were as good as possible and that the matches were as good as possible. And that's why some of these shows, if you see some of my overall ratings, A Night of Hoopla, a great show, very different show. Uh, Reclamation Night 1, a great crowd with a great show. Uh, all Star Driving Gets a 5, a very, very, very good, consistent, fun, easy to sit through show. Uh, Manhattan Mayhem 5, another very good, fun show. Road to Greatness Night 1, I thought was so enjoyable. Um, um, whatchamacallit. The ratings for that show aren't as strong as like the ratings of the previous shows I just mentioned, but that show is very short, very easy to sit through, and it's a lot of fun in general. So that's why I gave that show high marks. Uh, Death Before Dishonor 11, I thought was another very, very good show. I thought that show was also really easy to sit through and also a lot of fun. So just Ring of Honor... I had a good product during that time period. I haven't seen the shows after Death Before Dishonor 11. Um, I heard some of them aren't as good, uh, but I still I still plan on seeing them in the near future. And the TV during this time period was also good. Some of the world title tournament matches were really good, really underrated. Jay Lethal versus Sanjay Dutt in particular was a really damn good match that I don't that I don't remember getting a lot of love. And the ROH versus Scum War Games match I also thought was damn damn great. Um, that was, in my opinion, one of, one of, if not Ring of Honor's best match this year that I've seen. I still haven't seen all their best matches. I still, the only, the only like two matches that really come to mind that I haven't seen from ROH that could probably, uh, beat that match out are the Michael Elgin, the Michael Elgin versus ACH house show match from, it was from May, I believe. Uh, I heard that match was awesome. And the Glory by Honor the Glory by Honor 12, um, 10 man tag. The match that was like 70 minutes. I heard that match was also um, really, really, really strong. So, those matches are the ones that um, once I see those, 
those then I'll can truly figure out which one was Ring of Honor's best match of the year. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, those everything I just mentioned right now had some really, really good wrestling. Not a lot of great matches, but just a lot of consistent booking. And I'll talk about Delirious and the Ring of Honor product right now. Um, with Ring of Honor, as far as fan interest in the product goes, especially for a company like Ring of Honor that doesn't have all the complaints that everybody says, they don't have the best production values, um, they don't have a lot of star power, they don't have like a super advanced... They don't have like a super advanced network or communication device with their fans. Uh, they're on TV, but they're not on normal TV times that we're used to. They're on the most of their TV time slots are on the weekend, and you have to watch most of the shows in the DVR. And some of their TV time slots are at really late hours, like at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. They're not in the normal primetime slots from Monday through Thursday, like Raw and Impact are, and, and even SmackDown on Fridays. Uh, so, really, a big part of people getting interested in the product is really due to just the bu- the general buzz and fan momentum on the internet about the product and how people are reacting to the product. And I think that Ring of Honor has gone through stretches of momentum over the past year, but they can never be able to maintain it. And I think that's for a variety of reasons. First off, I think Delirious is um, an interesting booker. I enjoy his shows very much. I think his shows are much better than the Cornette Ring of Honor shows that Cornette booked, but he seems a little inconsistent in telling stories. He, some of his undercard feuds have like, you know, decent angles. Um, some of them are dumb and some of his main, some of his main card feuds, his, his main event booking, I personally think is really good. I think all the main, the storylines for the main events of most of the Ring of Honor I pay-per-views are done well. And some of the undercard ones are done well, but for whatever reason, for whatever reason, he just doesn't seem to maintain a general overall storyline archer in the or arc in the promotion as a whole. What I mean by that is that the main events have good storylines, but each of the main events on each pay per view have there's not really that clear cut path, that clear cut connection, that strong that strong storyline and or buzz about a specific wrestler or a specific team or a specific anything that connects from storyline to storyline, like with Daniel Bryan. I mean, I guess the best way to say that is he's not good at making stars. But like, like Daniel Bryan, which Daniel Bryan, I think it was the reverse last year in the fall and in the summer. Um, the storylines that Daniel Bryan were in weren't particularly great, but because we were so into Daniel Bryan, there was a connecting sense and a connecting connect. There was like a need to watch everything Daniel Bryan was involved in, and that's how all his storylines kind of tied together from the Shield to John Cena to Randy Orton, because you want to see the growth, the growth and evolution of Daniel Bryan. For Ring of Honor. I mean, this, I thought the storyline for Jay Briscoe and Adam Cole from Border Wars in particular, I thought that one was was pretty decent. I remember being really looking forward to that match, to that pay-per-view. I thought the Jay Briscoe-Kevin Steen stuff was good. I thought the Michael Elgin, Adam Cole, Jay Briscoe final battle main event had good build. But because Jay Briscoe, Michael Elgin, Adam Cole individually aren't really built as important stars, the storylines are good, but when the storyline's over... You have no reason to want to watch the next thing these guys are involved in. And I think that's the problem. I think I think you, you want to see a match, but when the match is over, it's almost like, eh. I, I, you don't have a, like a yearning sense. Oh, I want to see Jay Briscoe fight this guy next. I want to see Adam Cole fight this guy next. I want to see Mike Logan do this stuff in his career. You don't have that sense. Um, I think this year in general, Ring of Honor hasn't done the best job of developing top, top stars that make fans really, really care about wanting to see someone from show to show to show. They like seeing certain guys wrestle, but they're, it's not anything they think about once they stop watching the Ring of Honor show. Like, I think the true best stars in wrestling, the ones that fans remember, the ones that fans really resonate with, like the Daniel Bryans of the world, I think those are the type of guys that once they're done wrestling, once their shows are over, you're still thinking about them. And like in your spare time, like if from time to time, you think about, man, that was really cool what Daniel Bryan did. What's he going to do next? How are they going to go with Daniel Bryan? What are they, how are they going to book Daniel Bryan in the coming months? With and like You have that with a few other guys to WWE's credit. With Ring of Honor, you don't really have that sense with Jay Briscoe. You don't have that sense with Adam Cole. You don't have that sense with Michael Elgin. You recognize that they're all good, and you'll pay attention when the show's going on, but you won't care as soon as you turn off the product. And that's the problem with Ring of Honor. When the product is on, people like what they see, but nothing piques their interest enough to make them care about the product when they turn off the product. And that causes a lack of overarching momentum to follow on with the product when you don't care and you don't want to talk about the product when the product is off your television. And I think there's a variety of reasons of that. Me and a, a friend of mine on Twitter, good dude, TJ Hawk 411 
who writes for Formula One Media. A uh, very, very smart guy. I remember a few months back, me, him, and one of my other friends, uh, Jacob Cohen, uh, Mr. Jacob Cohen, on Twitter, uh, talked about how in Ring of Honor, especially in the in the early part of the year, anybody that would get a title shot was coming off a loss in a mid-card title shot in the previous pay-per-view. And that was so true. Jay Briscoe, um, Jay Briscoe beat Kevin Steen. Jay Briscoe beat Kevin Steen for the Ring of Honor title. The previous side pay-per-view, he and Mark Briscoe lost to Red Dragon the tag, in the tag title match. Then Adam Cole fought Jay Briscoe on Border Wars. At the previous side pay-per-view, Adam Cole got pinned clean by Matt Taven in a TV title match. Um, Mark Briscoe on the next round pay-per-view fought Jay Briscoe for the world title. And on the previous side pay-per-view, Mark Briscoe also got beat clean by, by Matt Taven in a TV title match. And that's not a way to build up stars. I'm not saying like a star can never lose, but just a simple presentation and context of how they lose is very important and how they win is also very important. That's why my friend Ben, Ben Turpin on Twitter, really hates like those weird roll-up finishes out of nowhere because it doesn't seem to actually get someone over. It just seems like it seems like a very fluky way and it's tough for the fans to take that guy seriously. And like with Adam Cole and all these guys, they just can't be losing to guys like Matt Taven dead clean in 10 minutes. Like that's not that's not how you buy someone seriously as a world title challenger. That's not how you buy someone seriously as a, as a main threat to the title. And that causes you to not build your stars to the highest level possible. And that causes fans not to be interested in the product when they turn off the product. Because I, I really think that, that that's the part that's emphasized. When people ask, people have always asked me like, why is Ring of Honor good and all this and that recently? What happened to Ring of Honor all this bullshit? I thought when Delirious took over from, from Cornetto, it was supposed to change and all this and that. The, the product of Ring of Honor isn't bad at all, in my opinion. Most of their shows are good. Almost all their shows are never, ever bad. Like, I, I think I've seen one Ring of Honor show in the past two years. That's a, a Two Ring of Honor shows in the past two years I think is actually bad. That would be Reclamation Night 2 and um, A Nightmare Begins from last year, which... Um, is like, the, in my opinion, the worst Ring of Honor show ever. I'm still, granted, I still haven't seen some of the worst shows ever, but I, th- I think that show's just awful. But anyways, it's not that the product is bad. Me and Trademark have also talked about it. It's not that it's bad. It's just that when it's over, you don't. nothing makes you care. When it's over, you don't want to care. And I think their inability to develop top-level top stars and their inability to develop key key storytelling is this is the reason they can they can write up good main event programs main event programs that make sense main event programs that build upon each other but you just don't care about the build and that's a flaw in how you tell your story like this the story is there everyone understands the story but how it's presented and how it's shown to you is a big part of the way on how you buy into the story Ring of is doing a good enough job of that. And like TJ was saying on Twitter in that same conversation between me, TJ, and Jacob, he said that he honestly thinks a bigger problem in wrestling is bookers underthinking wrestling rather than fans overthinking it. And I tend to agree. Everyone, I really do think that bookers take for granted how you can build a star. You can't just have them win the title. You can't just have them win a tournament. You can't. Oh, anytime any company has the mentality, this guy's about to get a big push. So before we give him the push, let's beat him and get the most out of him, which WWE does a lot and which Ring of Honor seems to do a, a little bit too. And that let's beat someone before we push them while so we can get so we can get someone else over. And then they get pushed and well, no one got over. Like because you were beating the guy before he hit his push. And the guy that beat him, he beat a guy who wasn't getting pushed, so he didn't even get anything from it. It's too much, too many people in wrestling are concerned with protecting everyone, with making sure everyone gets their fair share, everyone gets their win. I I mean, the reality is sometimes you really just got to get behind a guy and you can't have everybody win by roll-ups. You can't have everyone win in cheap ways. I'm calling Roderick Strong, for example, had a two out of three falls match. Uh, Actually, I'll give two good examples. Adam Cole versus Mark Briscoe. In uh, Adam Cole versus Mark Briscoe on television um, in Providence, Rhode Island, in the ROH TV title tournament, they spent so hard trying to protect Mark Briscoe in the match with the concussion, but the way Adam Cole beat him and the way he finished him still made Adam Cole look good, and it definitely helped Adam Cole in his career trajectory. Then you have Adam Cole versus Roderick Strong from, from Road to Greatness Night 2 in the Ringmasters Challenge match. That finish 
absolutely destroyed Adam Cole, in my opinion. That finish did him no favors. That finish did not make him look like a credible champion. That finish did not make him look like a top guy in the company. And then the very next show, he wins the title. And I'm, and I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, I... <sighs> There were so many ways they could have done this match to give to make Adam Cole look strong going into uh, Death Before Dishonor 11. But because they were so concerned with protecting Roderick Strong, and I like Roderick Strong, they did a finish that did not help Roderick. It did not help Adam Cole. And then Adam Cole won the title, and no one, which should have been a big deal, no one cared on what to see Adam Cole do on the next show. And that's the problem. They don't do a good enough job protecting their top guys. They don't do enough job building up their title challengers. And they don't do enough of a job of making credible stars. And that's, again, Delirious does a lot of great things as a booker. He has he has some good shows. He has some very, very, very good shows. But I think he really needs to learn how to connect to get to really, really get his top star over at a certain point. I thought they did a good job with Kevin Steen when Kevin Steen lost the belt. I thought they did a very good job in uh, making Kevin Steen look good and keeping Kevin Steen established towards the end of the day. Say what you want about Jim Cornette. I had a lot of my problems with Jim Cornette. Don't get me wrong. Far more than I do with Delirious. But when Kevin Steen was Jim Cornette's champion, that guy never lost. And before, more importantly, before Kevin Steen was champion, Kevin Steen wasn't losing to Matt Taven on tele- on, on a pay-per-view. Kevin Steen wasn't... If, uh, I should probably explain the Adam Cole Robert Strong finish to clarify my point. In the Ringmaster Challenge match, Adam Cole versus Robert Strong, it's a two out of three falls match. And the third falls of 30 minutes is a 15-minute time limit. In the third fall... I mean, the third fall is a 15-minute Ironman match. In the 15-minute Ironman match, Cole was up 1-0. to zero. He rolled up Roderick Strong with two minutes left in the time limit and then went outside the ring. And Roderick had a bad knee. And Roderick was just chasing Adam Cole around the ring for two full minutes before Adam Cole eventually won the match as time ran out. That was the finish. That was the finish. It was terrible. It made Adam Cole look really bad. It made Adam Cole look very uncredible. It made, didn't obviously didn't help do Roderick, Roderick Strong any favors. Like you really couldn't just beat Roderick Strong. Like you're so afraid. That's it's it's the same bullshit I have with the WWE with John Cena. John Cena is going to be over no matter what they do. They're so fucking afraid of beating him even slightly. Like that would actually hurt his standing with the company. They're so afraid of doing it that they have to go up and beyond above all costs to make sure if he ever loses, it's in the most fluky way possible and that some crazy shit would have to happen. And that was what happened. I mean, with Adam Cole, I just, I mean, if Adam Cole just like super kicked Roderick Strong at the time limit, would that really have killed Roderick Strong? Would Roderick Strong be drawing any less money for Ring of Honor if he were to appear on the next show? That's what this company didn't understand. So for as much as I say about Jim Cornette, like Kevin Steen, Kevin Steen wasn't running away from his opponents for 30 minutes. No, Kevin Steen was fighting El Generico in a last man standing match and winning. Kevin Steen was fighting Jimmy Jacobs in a, in a, in a hardcore match in, at the 10th anniversary show and winning. Kevin Steen was having great matches with Steve Carino and winning. That's how Cornette prepared him for the title, not what Delirious was doing with Adam Cole. And I think that's why Adam Cole's champion. A lot of us love Adam Cole. I'm a huge Adam Cole fan, both professionally and personally. I met he was like the first Ring of Honor wrestler I ever met. You know, I really he was super nice to me, and I really like I really like watching him wrestle. I bought his T-shirt. He's a great guy, and I'm a huge Adam Cole fan. But when Ring of Honor, when I watch Adam Cole wrestle, I'm very entertained. He does great things on the mic. But then when I turn off Ring of Honor, I don't care to see him wrestle again, and that's because of how they prepared him, in my opinion. And I think Delirious just needs to focus in on doing a better job on really, really protecting their top guys. And don't go, don't go half-ass. This, 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 is, this is the same for anything in life. If you go half-ass on a push, you get half-ass results. Don't have Adam Cole um, barely winning matches and made to look weak. Have Adam Cole go all the way. Have him win decisively. And that's how he gets over. Don't just try to protect everybody in sight. You just can't. You can't push everybody. I made a video about that a few years ago. You can't push everybody. Not everybody can be elevated to the top level. There's going to be some people who have to be slotted in a certain position. doesn't mean they have to stay there forever, but they have to be slotted there. And I think Ring of Honor doesn't do a good enough job protecting their main guys, especially especially with a guy like Matt Taven. I, who, I, I kind of like Matt Taven. Every match Matt Taven had, he won like in the most fluky, embarrassing, last minute, you don't actually believe he can actually win, beat this guy type of way. Every single match all year. And he never really got to the level that I thought he could. 
And again, this is a problem with their storytelling. I hope they really focus in on this. I hope they're really trying to change this aspect of their product because their product can be really good, but they really need to establish that momentum. The iPay-Per-View buzz also killed them. I thought they were establishing buzz before Best in the World. Um, and then Best in the World, uh, after the iPay-Per-View disaster, that killed their momentum. And then they were establishing more momentum during this period of shows I'm reviewing right now. And then at Death Before Dishonor, the pay-per-view again failed. That again killed their momentum. And then after that, with no eye paper, with no live eye pay per views, people really just start stopped caring. I think Ring of Honor can eventually get back to the promised land. Hopefully, they can get eye pay per view working again. I know you're all mad that like, oh, eye pay per view sucks. Why would you want it to work? They just keep fucking us over. If they can get it to work, if they can put enough money into it to make it work, I was watching the, I was hearing from about the Cornette shoot, the Breaking Cave and Feud, how Sinclair just invests no money to Ring of Honor, like almost no money whatsoever. If they were investing enough money into the eye pay per views and get those to work and get fans to trust them. That's how you can really establish more momentum by having this live show once a month and getting fans to care more about the week-to-week -week product, caring more about the shows, and just caring more about your top guys. I think the lack of top star booking and the lack of continued momentum with their IP reviews is really causing Ring of Honor a lot of problems. I, I'm not denying that they can't eventually get there. It just requires patience. It requires um, consistent, consistent dedication. Uh, to the shows and consistent dedication to the iPay per views, and I think it can be done. It can be done if booked properly, and hopefully, I think I think Delirious is a good enough booker that he's gonna he's gonna create some angle or some storyline that people are gonna like. And the goal there is to just maintain it, maintain the top guys coming off of that, and maintain the fan interest that you get. Because Ring of Honor is a cold product right now, and the only way to get hot is to get something that gets the people talking and make sure you can keep it. I don't deny that Delirious can get the people talking. What I'm not sure about is whether or not he can keep it and he can hold on to that buzz for as long as he can. Because that's usually what happens with this company. They get a buzz and then they do something to just let go of it. And that's why the product's kind of just kind of not interesting right now. <laughs> All right, but as far as the shows are concerned, the TV was really good. Really recommend it. Uh, Night of Hoopla is probably my favorite Ring of Honor show of the year. It's a very different show. Um, all the ratings that I have there um, aren't actually dis uh, descriptive of the match quality. They're more descriptive of how entertained I was, which in reality, that's probably how we should be star rating all wrestling matches anyways. Um, but nonetheless, because some of those matches are just like complete comedic jokes, but they were so funny. I can't just give it like two and a half stars, even though I loved it. No, I don't believe in that. If there's a match you love, why would you give it less than three or four stars? So some of those matches are just fine. We're really entertaining. Really a lot of fun. Davey Richards versus Silas Young was like the only the only one that I was just kind of mad on. I just didn't think that match was that funny. I didn't think that gimmick was very appealing. I think anything with transsexuals, no offense to any transsexuals out there, I just think putting a ring filled with transsexuals or trannies or anything like that, that's kind of a turn off to a product. I don't think people find that funny. I think people just find that a little weird and a little unappeasing. But nonetheless, the show is super entertaining, so much fun, so easy to sit through. Everyone's fucking hilarious on that show. Just like the funnest Ring of Honor show of the year, easily. Reclamation Night 1, I spoke about this earlier. Uh, a, a great show, which has an awesome crowd. My personal favorite match was the Four Corner Survival between Elgin Cole, Lethal, and Taven. Everyone looked awesome in that match. That's Taven's best Ring of Honor's performance, in my opinion. Eddie Edwards and Kyle O'Reilly was also really good, as was the main event. They were both missing something, I felt. Eddie Edwards and Kyle O'Reilly in particular was a very good match, but I don't know. Something about it was just missing with me. I know a lot of people really love that match. I just I, I didn't resonate the same. But... um. The the Champa Rhino match was really fun. For as long as it went, that match was really fun. And Richards and Fish was a really good main event. Reclamation Night 2, not much to say here. I didn't really like the show. Uh Champa and Silas Young is their best match in my opinion. And a really underrated match. Really, really, really good. Silas Young is probably the most underrated wrestler on the Ring of Honor roster. And the main event between Lethal and Elgin and Wolves. It's like, you know, a standard, very good American Wolves tag team match. I, I, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Mainly due to Lethal and Elgin, though. They, they both did a good job in that match. Everything else was kind of skippable. ACH, Bobby Fish, Rhino Bennett, Cole, BJ Wimmer were both very, all very disappointing. The women's match is the worst women's match I've seen all year. Cole Whitmer, in particular, is like legitimately a match. Whenever I hear people describe a wrestling match as when their criticism is, oh, that match was just a match. I hear that criticism a lot. Uh, that applies very much to this match. This match was a match. Absolutely nothing appealing or intriguing from the time it went. All turns driving at the five. A very good show. Very consistent show. Paul London versus Michael Luggett. One of my favorite Ring of Honor matches of the year. I think this match is awesome. I think this match is really underrated. 
And I think uh, Elgin and London both just have awesome chemistry, and I, I thought that match came off great. Everything else was pretty good. Um, a lot of good matches. Uh, the main event, I was very disappointed by. The main event, in my opinion, is very overrated. The main event is one of one of the worst Ring of Honor main events of the year. American Wolves versus the Forever Hooligans. The crowd wasn't really into this match. Nothing really clicked. The guys just seemed off. They didn't seem to have a continued sense of development. It kind of just seemed like they were doing a bunch of stuff. I like the Wolves, and I like the Hooligans, and I like their matches. I, I didn't like this one. I thought this one, I just thought this one was kind of mediocre. I gave it two and three quarters. It was okay. It was enjoyable, but it wasn't anything anything great or anything nearly out of this world. Um, Manhattan Mayhem 5, another fun show. The Young Monks versus the Forever Hooligans is another great match. The Forever Hooligans really had a nice run in Ring of Honor during this time. That match was a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. And I give the Hooligans um, a lot of credit there for, for, for putting on a good performance. Um, everything else was also pretty good. Steen and Strong was a lot of fun. Anderson Elga was very good. The Wolves versus Red Dragon was fun. Um, not as good as their as their Manhattan Mayhem match. I mean, not their not as good as their Super Card of Honor match, and not as good as their Final Battle 2012 match, in my opinion. But still, a very very fun outing from both teams. A very fun match. I really enjoyed it. Very consistent show again here with another great Ring of Honor match, just like in the previous show. The Road to Greatness shows Night One. I already talked about this. Night One's a lot of fun. Davy Richards versus Matt Taven is another very good Matt Taven match. Matt Taven had a decent run during this period. Kyle O'Reilly versus Cedric Alexander is a very underrated match. That match is so, so, so good. Kyle O'Reilly really, really hit his stride in the fall and the summer of 2013. He really became one of the top in the workers on the indie scene during this time. And Cole and Schauber versus Elkin and Steen was, was a fun main event. A fun show, a really fun show in my opinion. All, all the matches were really enjoyable. Road to Greatness Night 2, this one's not as fun. David Richards and Michael Bennett's a good match. And uh, the Proving Ground matches is really fun, really fast-paced, the tag match. But everything else is just kind of disappointing. Uh, uh, Adam Cole versus Roderick Strong is a good main event, but the finish is horrible. The finish is the worst finish to a Ring of Honor match all year, in my opinion. It's a very good match still, but it's just a terrible, terrible finish. Really, really kills the match. Think Dolph Ziggler versus Alberto Del Rio from Money in the Bank 2013. That same type of match. Just a really fun match, and you're just pissed that the match was so good and the finish was so terrible. And that's what this match was. Uh, and Death Before Dishonor 11, a very, very good show again. Very consistent as well. Um, the Wolves, Hooligans, in my opinion, had their best match on this show. I know a lot of people don't like this match. I was super entertained by it. I really, really, really dug it. And uh, Steen Elgin was really fun. Colt Champa was also really fun. Strong and Marvin I enjoyed. The, the eight-man tag I thought was fun. Nice action. Some high-paced spots. Really got the crowd going. Really entertaining. And the main event of Cole and Elgin was a really good match. Not as good as their... PWG um, finals bola match, but still a very fun match. They told a great story, and Cole did look pretty good coming and coming coming off the win in this match. So I give him that. I criticized Delirious booking of Cole leading up to the title win, but the actual match where he won the title, I thought they did a good job. They protected Elgin too. So I, and in this case, I actually recommend protecting Michael Elgin. And it's not like Cole beat him via roll up. Like Michael Elgin was just really beat up because he had a harder match with Steen than Cole did with Champa. But fun show as well. Another really good show, really consistent. So yeah, Ring of Honor had some really consistent shows during this time period. Some two kind of subpar shows, but for the most part, most of it was really, really consistent, a really fun product during this period. I would definitely recommend going back, watching all these shows, especially a night of hoopla. That, in my opinion, is the most fun ring of wrestling show all year, in my opinion. Although I haven't seen the PWG shows. But nonetheless, that's my thoughts on Ring of Honor. That's my thoughts on the product. That's my thoughts on momentum in general. I'm Big Red 310. I'm out. Thank you all for listening. Goodbye.